Hey. It's Tony here. Uh, it's a long story short. It's final season. Coming up on it. Uh, you know, lots of lots of papers, lots of projects. I'm also I'm also sick. I uh, feel feel like garbage. It's a stressful time. So, for a moment before we start here, why don't we just why don't we just take a, a, a deep breath to kind of level ourselves out here a little bit. Let's just. Oh yes. <sighs> yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. Feeling level. All right. Ah, uh, man. You know, it doesn't surprise me that taking a, a deep breath can help when you're feeling stressed because uh, breathing is how our bodies extract oxygen from the air, which is a crucial component in the process that produces adenosine triphosphate, ATP. It's the major power molecule that the cells in your body use to keep you from being a dead chunk of meat as opposed to a living one. So it's a good thing then that oxygen isn't a finite resource. But could you imagine what life would be like if it was? I mean, it would be a big deal because if you run out of oxygen, you've got about four minutes to uh, make good with whatever you got to make good with before your brain taps out and you stop existing. People would probably panic for a while um, until they stop panicking, until they stop moving. Uh, but it wouldn't just be people, it would be most complex life on Earth. Because the truth is that the only living things that don't rely on oxygen, well, they're not really things that we interact with often. Or at least things that we think of as interacting with often. I'm sure there's something that... Uh, doesn't use oxygen, but you, gee, that, that, that's not the point, all right? Anyway, most living things on Earth would uh, would kick the bucket if oxygen weren't around. So it's a good thing, then, that oxygen is naturally replenished by sources and processes that just kind of keep on going. We don't have to worry about this part, at least not right now. All right, give me a minute. I I just I need to. This is this is dirty. My desk is obnoxious. It's just we're gonna we're gonna do that thing where I it, whew, shaved and everything. Man, well, thankfully oxygen is renewable. Petroleum, however, is not. And funny enough, the effects that running out of petroleum would have on human society are similar to the effects that running out of oxygen would have on well the human body. As it stands, the incredible complex system of machines, products, transportation, governments, and businesses that we rely on for our current ridiculous standard of living, well, at the heart of the majority of these things, petroleum is what provides the energy. It's our society's oxygen. We build stuff with it too. Products containing petroleum, such as plastics, clothing, and even things like shampoo and contact lenses would cease to exist. Also, in case it wasn't clear, the supply of electricity worldwide would be disrupted, to say the least, causing mass chaos as people were suddenly unable to heat and light their homes, freeze their food, or use appliances. It seems we've built our society on a foundation that is draining away. Is there any way to slow or even prevent this impending societal suffocation? Today, on Long Story Short, we're talking about peak oil theory. Peak oil theory, otherwise known as Hubbard Peak Theory, was proposed by an American geologist named M. King Hubbard in 1956. It's based on the fact that there is a finite supply of hydrocarbon fossil fuels in existence on Earth. These fuels are chemicals made of hydrogen and carbon atoms, and they are notoriously easy to convince to catch on fire. These include coal, oil, and natural gas deposits, which are all found under the ground. And we've kind of sort of built our entire modern society around tapping into them. 
Oil accounts for 35% of the total global energy production. Coal produces 26.7% of the total energy supply. And natural gas produces 22.6% of the total energy supply. So where'd this stuff come from? In short, lots of dead things, plus hundreds of millions of years. They are the ancient remains of sea organisms, among other things. When they died, they stopped swimming and fell to the seabed, and their tiny, carbon-rich corpses were buried by sediment. As time passed, more sediment was deposited, and the remains were pushed further and further underground. This exposed the remains to high environmental pressures and temperatures, which caused them to undergo a number of chemical changes, which ultimately resulted in them transforming into petroleum and eventually natural gas. In case the whole millions of years thing wasn't entirely clear, this process is grossly outpaced by the rate we humans use the stuff. Eventually, we are going to run out, and when we do, it's not going to be pretty. Roughly 84% of the world's total energy comes from hydrocarbon chemicals. 84%! Talk about putting all our eggs into one basket. So what's the backup plan then? Well, we don't really have one ready as of now, because many of our alternate energy sources, as they are currently implemented today, start to present problems when we scale them up to petroleum's level. According to a business report by AltaCorp Capital, a Canadian investment firm which has money in the energy business, to replace the current global oil production of 84.4 million barrels per day with corn ethanol, it would take a corn field the combined size of the United States, China, and India. This area is actually greater than the currently used arable land in the world. If mankind was to convert all of the land now being used for growing crops, we would only be able to replace the energy from 54 million barrels per day of oil. This represents only 64% of current global oil production. Actually takes some effort to do that with your fingers. Additionally, to replace the coal-fired electricity in the United States, it would take solar panels valued at approximately $4.4 trillion. The limiting factor, moreover, is the inability to store the power generated during sunny periods for use throughout darkness and times of cloud cover. There is no current technology to store this amount of electricity on a practical basis. These problems, and those like them, aren't small. We are working on things to fix them. Tesla's new battery packs could change the game for solar. But if it's really going to put a dent in this problem, well, it's got big shoes to fill. This is an unfortunate side effect of both the magnitude of the present scope of petroleum extraction and technological limitations in alternate fuel sources. So let's talk theory. M. King Hubbard presented his peak oil theory in 1956 to a petroleum industry conference as a potential course that human civilization's petroleum production could take. The rate of oil production over time can be modeled on a graph. As you can see, it forms a non-random statistical structure. This graph can be described as the derivative of a structure known as a logistic curve. This sigmoidal curve starts at zero, rises to a plateau where it peaks. The rates of change of this structure when applied to the petroleum production correspond to the rates of resource extraction, which is what M. King Hubbard was interested in. Peak oil theory is actually pretty straightforward in this way. It assumes that petroleum production starts at zero. This represents the time before oil was discovered. As hydrocarbon reserves are discovered, oil is produced. Advancements in technology and the discovery of new reserves of hydrocarbon resources increase petroleum production further. Eventually, the rate of technological development slows and new reserves stop being found and slowly, decreasing net oil production begins to become a thing. Once all hydrocarbon reserves have been drained from the planet, oil production reaches zero once again. If humans can manage to wait 500 million years and allow hydrocarbon reserves to form again, the process can be repeated ad infinitum. But we just got done talking about how we probably can't go any years without it, and we would have to go millions. In other words, we've got a problem here. 
Since peak oil theory is just a theory, it begs the question, is it true? Will petroleum production follow this semi-logistical curve up from zero and then back down? Let's see what it's done so far. Through the 20th century, peak oil theory almost perfectly described petroleum production rates. Domestic production ramped up gradually over time. The development of the global oil industry had important economic ramifications on oil-rich regions of the globe. For example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia found itself rolling around in cash because of its huge petroleum reserves. The United States also tapped into major oil fields in Texas, Alaska, the Appalachian Mountains, the Gulf of Mexico, and Southern California, among others, becoming the third largest producer of oil in the world. Oil extraction is still a major industry in Russia, which supplies many of the former Soviet satellite states with cheap energy in order to maintain its sphere of influence in Eastern Eurasia. Uh, scratch that, uh, regular Eurasia, not Eastern Eurasia. Eastern Eurasia doesn't even make any sense. Anyway, during the 1970s, as M. King Hubbard had theorized would eventually happen, oil production began to drop. This caused the energy crisis of the 1970s, a general economic recession in the US and abroad. Unlike other recessions, this recession affected the entire world's economy across most industries because it was fueled by oil problems. And again, oil is everything. However, due to increased demand and a perceived supply limitation, the petroleum industry saw record profits and helped continue to drive the world economy. This worldwide decline in petroleum production forced the world governments to adopt more sustainable petroleum consumption patterns, as was seen in the United States, where gasoline rationing was actually a thing. It also forced Western powers to pursue new diplomatic policies in the Middle East, such as the Carter Doctrine, which identifies the annexation of the Persian Gulf by a superpower as an assault on the United States because we need that oil. If that was in the 1970s, shouldn't we be living in the apocalypse by now? Well, the actual path of petroleum production has diverged from M. King Hubbard's theory in recent years. Around 2010, US petroleum production leveled off and then rose sharply. This should not happen. After all, once production starts to decrease, the theory states it should continue to decrease until it reaches zero. So what gives? A couple of things, actually. But a big one is fracking. Fracking opened up previously inaccessible deposits deep in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, one of the oldest ranges on Earth. There are immense hydrocarbon reserves locked away under the mountains. In fact, we've already dug out much of them in the form of coal. But thanks to fracking, we've got access to even more. But of course, fracking is a controversial topic in the United States because it's not a get out of jail free card. There are strings attached and there's a debate as to whether or not they are worth it at all. To frack, as I guess you'd say, petroleum extraction companies drill a channel to the rock where the deposit is located. They then inject water, sand, and fracking chemicals into the rock in order to split it apart and access the energy reserves inside. The chief benefit of fracking is that it unlocks previously inaccessible fuel deposits hidden deep within solid rock. This pushes the eventual end of petroleum production, as predicted by M. King Hubbard, further into the future. This is a good thing for society because, as we have discussed, we are not ready to run out right now. We unquestionably need more time, at least a little bit, to develop a workaround for a petroleum-free world. It also stimulates the economy by growing the energy sector. But, as I said, there are strings. Specifically, fracking is generally bad for the environment and can easily become absolutely awful. Industrial runoff from the mixture injected into the rock is potentially carcinogenic and can leach into the groundwater supply above whatever hydrocarbon reserves you're trying to frack. This contamination can be widespread and absolutely devastating. These chemicals are toxic, and as it stands, we can't uncontaminate groundwater. Once you goof it up, is goofed. 
this is bad because people need to drink the stuff. Funny enough, fracking also takes a lot of water itself, further lowering the water table. The development of fracking infrastructure also has problems. It includes motorways and extraction facilities, and it requires the industrialization of a lot of natural space, which of course is always disruptive to the local ecosystem. The ever-present threat of accidental spills is also a serious ecological disaster looming over our heads. But the real stinker when it comes to fracking is that water thing. Because right now, water is renewable, but its renewability doesn't guarantee that it will stay clean or drinkable. By default, only about 2.5% of the Earth's water is, and much less of that is actually accessible to us. That would be something if we uh, messed that up. Running out of water, that'd be, that'd be bad. But that's a topic for another video. So. What do you think? Will we solve the energy crisis before we are plunged into another dark age? How will that happen, if it does? For right now, do the benefits of something like fracking outweigh the costs? I personally don't think so, because of that whole water thing. But it wouldn't be a big deal if it were an easy question to answer. So let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.